So welcome back. We are in the fourth class now. In the last class, we looked at all the different layers of the scriptures from where we can get this self-knowledge, the, the Shruti, the, the Aporisheya, the not what was not a product of human intellect where the original teaching was given in the Vedas and then the Smriti, which is everything which is not a Shruti, such as Bhagavad Gita, where the great rishis listened to this teaching, assimilated it, and then gave it in uh, their own words again. And then we, we also looked at other scriptures, uh, layers like Brahma Sutrani, which are the teachings given in codified form and giving a logical support and reasoning to the teaching. And we said together how the 10 Upanishads of the Shruti, Bhagavad Gita, of the Smriti, and the Brahma Sutrani are called the Prasthana Trayam, the three pillars of Vedanta that any Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta student studies today. And in, in addition to this, there is also these layers of text called Prakarna Granthas, uh, Prakarnas, which was written by more recent Acharyas, including Adi Shankaracharya, Ramana Maharishi, to give the same teaching in uh, a more simplified format for uh, students to understand better. So Tathvabodha is one such Prakarna Granta where the entire essence of the teaching is given. And there are also some other Prakarnas where one aspect of the teaching is covered. We looked at all these and then we entered into the first section of Tattva Bodha, which was Sadhana Chetushtaya, which is the fourfold qualifications of a spiritual seeker. So one who has all these four qualifications will be able to fully assimilate this knowledge and will be able to fully get the benefit of this knowledge. But uh, so we were looking at what these fourfold qualifications were and we read the first Mangala Charnam verse and the first verse which was introducing it which said Sadhana Chetushtayam Kim, what is Sadhana Chetushtaya? And the reply came Nitya Anitya Vastu Vivekaha Iha Mutrartha Palaboga Viragaha Shama Adi Shatka Sampattihi Mukshutvam Cheti. So the four qualifications are just listed out here and they'll be explained in detail. Among this, the first one was Viveka, which is discrimination or discernment, you can say. And it says Nitya Anitya Vastu Viveka. Anitya is what is eternal. Anitya is what is impermanent. And the discernment between these two is what is Viveka and Viragaha was described as Iha Amurtartha Palaboga Viragaha. Viraga means dispassion, uh, dispassion from fruits of action here or at a future point in time or in a future world. Viragaha, Raga is attachment and Viraga is free from this, being free from this excessive attachment. Shama Adi Chatka Sampati means, refers to the sixfold disciplines beginning with Shama and Adi means etc. Sampati means wealth. So these six inner disciplines are known as in inner wealth for a seeker. And finally was Mumukshutvam, the fourth one, so you don't have to remember these yet because we will be going through all of them in detail, right? So fourth one is Mumukshutvam, which is the desire, the intense desire for moksha. So the difference between um, 
someone, you know, simply studying Vedanta because you're curious about it versus someone really desiring the end result that Vedanta promises, which is liberation. Uh, that is a difference here. And the qualification for uh, one who has this is called Mumukshu. So together, these four are, you can remember them as the four Ds, uh, discrimination, dispassion, discipline, and desire. It's easy for you to remember. And now we will look at each of them in detail. Right? If you come to your second page, last verse, I will chant and you can repeat after me. Nitya nitya vastu viveka kaha. Nitya nitya vastu viveka Nitya vastu ekam brahma. Nitya vastu vivekam brahma. Tad vyati riktam. Meet you all again. Yeah. So again, the question comes, Kaha Vivekaha. So you've given me all these four names, but I'm not any more enlightened. So can you please explain what is Vivekaha? The student asks. Uh, what do you, what is, do we mean by discrimination between the permanent thing and the impermanent thing? Uh, what is permanent? What is Nityam and what is this Anityam? Uh, you might wonder, is there even such a thing as permanent? So far, we've seen that everything we come across is impermanent, isn't it? There are a few things which are, you know, relatively permanent, like the sun and the stars. Um, they live for millions of years, but they too at some point die. And... Um, there is, you know, there are some things like um, this, um, sorry. Sorry, I just had a little issue with my computer here. Yes, so what is, is there anything such as uh, permanent? We come across these relatively permanent things, but... Um, Mostly everything else, uh, like you might get a car, a house, all these are impermanent. You might have relationships, but these two are impermanent. Some might last two years, 10 years, or till one of the people die, but eventually everything seems to end. Right? So what does it mean to seek something permanent? So let's look at the... Um, Purusharthas again. So we said that we all want happiness. We're all seeking happiness. And we are we're all seeking permanent happiness, right? We don't want happiness just today or tomorrow, not just in this moment, but we want to be permanently happy. And we want an unlimited amount of this happiness. So we have these various needs and wants, the goals which we call the purusharthas because uh, that we seek because we are looking for this happiness what does it mean to have artha as a goal in life we said artha means security so the security we could be seeking in the form of a career family um, many things but uh, let's consider this are you Seeking security or are you seeking freedom from insecurity? So if a person has a problem with their legs and uh, they're using crutches for some time, so this crutches is acting as uh, giving, making them feel more secure while they walk, till, while their leg heals. 
So are they really seeking the crutches? Do they want the crutches or do they want to be uh, rid of this problem with their legs so that they can stand on their own two feet and don't not have to rely on the crutches, right? So no one wants crutches yet uh, we go seeking various kinds of crutches. Let's uh, look at um, what we mean as karma as a goal. So karma is pleasure. When we seek pleasure, when we seek uh, happiness, are we seeking happiness or are we seeking to be free from unhappiness? Take a, take the moment. So we, we, would, we would all probably had a headache at some point in our life, right? So when you have a headache, what is happiness for you at that point? happiness would be not having the headache right so we're trying to if we were rid of the headache we would be happy that's what we would feel at that point when we have the headache but when you actually at any most of the 99 percent of the time when you do not have a headache uh, you're not simply happy because you don't have a headache Right. So if we were present to what was, if we were present to our full nature, we would be happy all the time. But instead, we think there is something lacking and we go looking after, looking for things, uh, experiences to fill this feeling of lack. Uh, basically, we go looking for these crutches. Um, we use money, fame, family as crutches. Uh, and we are looking to remove this feeling of unhappiness. Honestly, there is nothing wrong with um, using any of these things as crutches. Um, you can take pleasure, take happiness from any of these things. The problem comes when you mistakenly think that any of these things can give you permanent happiness. And you mistakenly think that your happiness is dependent on these things. So we could do the same with even the Purushartha of uh, Dharma. If you're doing good deeds because you think something good will happen to you uh, because you will go to heaven later, it will also, this punyam, this uh, good karma you accumulate will also get exhausted at that point. So what will happen when you reach heaven? You would be, you would enjoy heaven and um, you would get kicked out of heaven at some point when that good karma is exhausted. But even in heaven, you would be carrying the same mindset that you have right now and uh, where you will not be fully satisfied. So it's even that heaven will be subject to the same doshas that we talked about. Moreover, if I tell you uh, there is something between you and heaven right now, right? And that thing is death. If I say you can go to heaven right now, uh, most of you would probably say, okay, maybe not right now. Let's wait another 10, 20 years and I'll go to heaven. So that's not, when we really inquire into it, that's not really what we are looking for either. So we must inquire. Am I seeking, uh, if I'm seeking security or happiness, it must be because I think I'm an insecure or unhappy person. It's not a very nice thing to acknowledge. Most of us would not like to think we are unhappy or insecure people. So is that a correct conclusion? Shastra tells us that this is actually because of a confusion. Confusion which makes me think I'm a limited being, that I am this temporary body or mind. For sure, if I'm simply this body, then I have a reason to be insecure. This is a very fragile system uh, it can easily get hurt it can easily get damaged I can fall sick and I can the body can die uh, so if 
I really thought I was the body. It's, uh, I have a reason to be insecure. The problem is when we inquire into what am I, we, there is not complete ignorance. There is uh, some knowledge of what I am, right? So we give often the example of Raju Sarpa, the snake and rope. This is, you'll keep hearing this example, so I'll explain it once. A person is walking at twilight, twilight meaning there is just a little bit of light, and they see a rope. And because of the dim light, they mistake that rope for a snake and they get scared. So there is real fear generated out of a false snake. Now, if there was no light at all, if there was complete ignorance, then they would not spot the rope and there would be no fear. Also, if there was full light, if there was full knowledge, uh, they would see the rope for what it was. And again, there would be no fear. The fear comes because of this twilight, this half knowledge situation where they see the rope and they think it's a snake, right? They mistake it for a snake. So Shastra tells us even what we think about ourselves is this kind of confusion. So we're not completely ignorant about our real nature. We have a confusion about our real nature. And whenever there is a confusion, uh, there needs to be a vichara, there needs to be an inquiry. And uh, that's what this, that's where viveka is required. What exactly do we inquire into? Shastra is telling us here that we must inquire into what is permanent and what is impermanent of all these various goals that I have, what will give me permanent lasting happiness and what is ephemeral, what is fleeting. And this permanent thing, the scriptures tell us that thankfully there is at least one permanent thing and that is Brahman. That is you. So you are the only permanent thing this Brahman you is infinitely big and a limitless entity. Brah means big. Brahma means the biggest thing, infinite. Infinite would mean that it is free from limitations of space and time. And other than this Brahman, other than you, tad vyatiriktam, everything else, sarva manityam, all of those things are impermanent. If we take this human body, I am here and not anywhere else, right? So I'm limited in space. Uh, the body also exists only in one period of time from your date of birth to the date of death. So it's limited in time. But I, my real nature, am not limited by anything, not even time and space. Other than Brahman, Shastra will tell you that everything else is impermanent, which means all people, all situations, whether good or bad, all experiences, all objects, everything else is impermanent. Again, there is nothing wrong from enjoying an impermanent object. The problem occurs when I think I want this to last forever. You could see a beautiful rose, uh, smell it and uh, feel complete joy. Uh, the problem happens when I think I want this rose to live forever and give me this fragrance every day. It's not possible. Therefore, a spiritual person or an intelligent person is one who has understood that emotional dependence on an unstable world is risky which is why probably a lot of you came to this inquiry that uh, either from some kind of disappointments in life or because you got everything that you chased perhaps and even that you realize that even then 
it doesn't seem to be giving you that permanent happiness. There is still something lacking. So as an intelligent person, we do not have create emotional dependencies on an unstable world. We, an emotional, a spiritual person, a, one, a seeker, slowly turns their attention away from the impermanent to the permanent. They understand that permanent happiness and security obviously cannot come from an impermanent thing. When one sees this very clearly, you will start to use the world only for one purpose, to discover what is permanent. Now, how can you achieve something which is permanent and infinite? Right? So can any limited action any limited spiritual practice, um, say doing karma yoga, doing meditation, doing japa, all these are actions which are limited, right? So can any of these limited actions make you achieve something permanent? Again, the answer is no. Uh, by very definition of permanent, it means it must have always been there. Also, some limited action cannot give you something infinite. So you do a number of good deeds, you can um, get to heaven or um, get to heaven, but you did a limited action. Uh, does it make sense that you will get permanent heaven from the limited actions. Many religions promise that. They say live a good life and you can go to heaven for eternity. Does that make sense? The logic tells us, intellect tells us that something limited cannot get you the infinite. So how is this possible? it would only be possible if you already were infinite, if you already were permanent. You cannot achieve this by anything. So if I am already permanent and infinite, then what am I here listening to Shastra for? It's to enjoy the f knowledge. It's, it, it's to enjoy the... Uh, so it's basically thinking... Um, to remove this confusion, which uh, keeps you from enjoying the benefit of your own fullness. That's what Shastra is going to do. It's not going to add anything to you. It's only going to remove this ignorance, which exists. And uh, this... And uh, Shankara... Um, Time and again, in many commentaries, we'll talk about this, how uh, limited action cannot give you permanent results. So we need the discernment as a spiritual seeker between what is permanent and impermanent and also the discernment to know what will help me, in quotes, achieve this permanent thing. Right? So... In short, Viveka is, um, it's then in the next verse says, I am eva nitya nitya vastu vivekaha. I am eva, this alone is the discernment between what is nitya and anitya. This is Viveka. Any questions? So understanding Vivekaha is very important because everything, all the other qualifications stem from that Vivekaha. Okay, if there's no questions, we will continue to the next one. If you can come to your page three, the third verse. It says... You can repeat after me. Viragah kaha. 
The student asks, what is viragaha? Viraga can be translated into dispassion. And the answer comes, it is the absence of desire from fruits of action in this world or a future world, which means you can take it as heaven or uh, a future lifetime. So we already said that any finite action can only produce a finite result of fruit. And viragaha is hence absence of raga, uh, longing for these fruits. True dispassion actually can only stem from true discernment. Only when um, you realize that nothing anithyam can really give you what you are seeking, then you start having dispassion towards these anitya things. It, um, it implies having viragaha implies um, an absence of longing uh, or dependence on things. And it also implies an absence of the opposite, uh, dvesha, an aversion to things. It's just like nothing can really give you permanent happiness. Nothing can really give you permanent unhappiness either. Attaching an excessive value to something is removed when one has vairag when has uh, vairagya. So, what is excessive here that we're talking about? So, in a desire, desire itself is natural process and perfectly fine. For example, a desire for food is real because the it's objective to say that food will satiate my hunger. So I want to go find food and feed this body. So eat and I want to keep this body in good health to do the things that I want to do. So eating to maintain this body is a perfectly fine desire. But when you have excessive desire for food, when you live to eat, uh, when you think uh, food is uh, gives me comfort or uh, food gives me joy, when you start attaching excessive qualities to the simple food, you will ruin the very same body that it was meant to nurture. That's when food has become a binding desire to you. Similarly, there are there can be a desire for several things that we all have, and those desires must be understood. Are they binding desires or non-binding? If uh, so, examine all the desires you have for yourself. When there is binding, when uh, that's when they start becoming uh, obstacles on your path. If there is no binding, then there is vairagyam there. That is perfectly fine. It's this, um, uh, this det uh, vairagyam can also be translated as detachment, right? Which sounds very cold in a way. It sounds like, um, especially when you say someone is detached to not just objects, but People in their life, it sounds very cold. But a yogi, a jnani, is not a cold person. In fact, they are capable of a lot more love than an ajnani, than a person without this knowledge of the self. In fact, a jnani can have the purest, deepest love for the simplest things. They can look at a simple flower and be filled with absolute joy and love. But because of, you know, this um, culture we live in, um, 
detachment is made to sound so cold. Even books and movies propagate this romantic idea, don't they? That uh, when you truly love someone, you cannot live without them. You could be talking about a romantic partner or you could be talking about even a parent-child relationship. But there is often this um, romanticization of this thought that I cannot live without this person. Is that really true? And if it's true, is that love or is it attachment? Have you ever wondered what is the difference between love and attachment? Could I have some answers which come to your mind? Binding that's versus non binding. Okay, that's good. Conditional versus, unconditional versus conditional. Good, yes. One is a selfish element. I think attachment is for self. I need you. Whereas uh, with the uh, Detachment love means you you just love the person, but have you know you're ready to let that person go free. Good. Yes, Maharaj. Attachment is clinging. Attachment is clinging to something very hard and not ready to leave. Yes, correct. Yeah. Clinging. Another good word for blinding, uh, binding. Hmm. Not to treat it like a possession and let go. All right, yes. Does um, true love want to give or get? If you truly love someone, do you want something from them more? Yes, give. In true love, there is sacrifice. In true love, there is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Yes. I mean, Sacrifice might be depends what you mean by sacrifice. That means you are ready to. You are not uh, looking towards getting something all the time. Your expectation. You are free. You are ready to give up. Give yes. something. Giving give without up. expectation. I like that. Yes. Better than sacrifice. So, Spannaji, anything if you are gonna attach, it comes with some kind of expectation. Yeah. Be it material thing and living thing, anything. It comes with expectation. You are, if you are clinging to anything. Correct. So mostly, um, it love doesn't have any expectations. If you just love someone, like um, uh, the love a mother might have for the newborn child, uh, that's probably the purest form of unconditional love we see in this world and that to last that unconditionality of that love also lasts for a very short time uh, generally when we love there is an expectation right of either thing or a person there's an expectation that if it's a person the very least that they would love you back or you love that person because of the way they make you feel they make you feel good so there is always this conditionality. So when you look at this, uh, when you inquire into this love versus attachment, uh, and you check, is there is this a conditional feeling or it is an unconditional feeling? Uh, is this selfish or is it selfless? Do I want something from this? Or do I simply want to give? When you inquire from all these angles and you then look at the various relationships in your life, uh, ask yourself, are you in attachment or are you in love with all these people? It's a difficult question to actually ask ourselves. When the first time I heard this, I it felt honestly like a slap on my face because I felt like, oh, I've never loved in my life because I could not um, really find an example of pure, unconditional love. We are all capable of these moments of pure, unconditional love, but conditionality creeps in. And it's okay, we can be 
soft with ourselves about this because if we were truly capable of pure unconditional love by the definition it means without conditions means if you're capable of this pure unconditional love for one person or one thing um, you should be able to have this love for everything and everyone right so that's really the ultimate freedom at that point there is nothing left to be achieved um, so we can all practice to have these moments of more uh, to build our capacity of unconditional love at least in from moments to moments but it's okay if we find that we are not completely capable of it but more and more we can keep inquiring you know am I seeking something from the objects and relationships in my life or am I giving love true love will be a sign of freedom whereas attachment is a form of dependence so if as a spiritual seeker what I want is freedom I will choose to be loving I will choose to give love love is born out of a strong mind and attachment is born out of a weak mind in love the intellect is clear and it will not lead to any adharmic actions adharmic meaning any wrong actions in this case whereas attachment could we hear of so many horrible things that people have done in a fit of uh, jealousy or rage right i think in some countries uh, it's even forgiven an action um, which is done in passion in the moment is actually it's, a, it's taken as a valid excuse in the law even because they say this person was not in their senses because they got so taken away by their emotion. But do we want to be one of those people who get um, so taken away by their emotion? It's again, a romanticized concept to be a passionate person. Uh, but in Vedanta, we frown upon it. This is simply a person who is not in control of their own mind and senses. Love is the sign of a jnani and attachment is a sign of a samsari. So vairagyam is freedom from attachment. When we say um, vairagyam, it means that it doesn't mean you do not have any desires left. It just means that you do not have any binding to those desires. So even in front of an enlightened person, you put a chocolate and a strawberry ice cream, they will pick one because they would prefer one over the other. But if their favorite is not there, they're not going to be upset about it. It's kind of a silly example, but it's just to say that this is how everything, without binding, everything just becomes a mere preference. If... Um, this mere preferences will also determine what an enlightened person does with their life. Some went and sat in caves for the next, uh, the rest of their lives. Many others taught. A few others, uh, you know, set up like Swami Chinmananda, set up big missions to spread this knowledge across the world. Um, few might have taken to activism and fighting for human rights and so on. So what they do after is kind of based on their vasanas, their natural tendencies. But from the outside, you will no one, no one else can tell if someone has um, that true vairagyam or not. It's only the person doing that um, who will know themselves. Right. So similarly, you can't tell if someone is a jnani or not. The jnani could be someone who served you your morning chai when you take, took a walk, your morning walk today. It could be that chai wala on the street. It um, look as an outsider, you don't know if the person pouring that chai is completely detached from that action. They're not. Uh, uh, being detached meaning they don't associate with the identity of I am the chai wala and I am pouring this chai and this is my job this is my role you know uh, this is all 
this is all my status is there in the world. You know, if you have all those other associations, then there is no vairagyam. But uh, vairagyam could be just there is chai could, needs to be poured and I'm pouring the chai, you know. So you're not attached to the action anymore. Then there is vairagyam. Any questions on this? I have a question. I um, it's a little. It, it, I'll use the word curiosity. I don't know how it fits in all of this. Okay. It's a beautiful thought to say. You know, it should be vairagyam, and you write that instant when you say there is, there is vairagyam. You can start loving everything. Um, my question is really about action, actually, and that usually is backed by first curiosity and. Yes, sometimes then it becomes, you know, a passion uh, for cause or something for people. If you were to not have the latter, but that curiosity also stems from somewhere. And I don't know where it stems from. Uh, I wonder if there is anything in the scriptures or if you have a perspective on how do we drive action um, with complete viragyam. You can do what is in front of you, but like in the example of a chaiwala, the curiosity of can I do this in a way which serves like I mentioned true like complete full vairagyam can only come from viveka you know when you understand when the viveka is already there you lose the you lose the value for things which do not uh, are not no longer going to give you what you're looking for, right? So th all these qualities actually bind together in the end. So if you, the fourth quality, we will talk about mumukshuttam. If you have mumukshuttam quality already where you realize the only goal I have is liberation, automatically you will have vairagyam for all the other goals, right? Because they're... But in the, we will talk about how it all ties together, but in the short run, um, how to build vairagyam, uh, you can just look at your desires, you can examine your desires, and if you find that they're non-binding, there is really no problem, right? Go ahead and uh, indulge in that. If you see there is a chance of binding being created, then you exercise some more self-control, some more restraint. Uh, for example, your, um, actually this again ties into the next disciplines that we're talking about. But uh, at this point, you can just examine what is this thing you have a binding desire for and look at how can you make it not binding. So simple curiosity, there is nothing wrong with that, that you were asking about. I'm not sure if I didn't completely get your question, but if you have a curiosity about something, even a jnani will have curiosity about things. There's nothing wrong with that. What they do um, will depend on their vasanas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Spandanaji just... One question. So related to what you said, mm -hmm. um, say in, in the setup of a family where uh, you buy things which otherwise you might not, but the family people people in the family need it. Say a car or something fancy, dresses and yes. stuff like that. Yes. You go ahead and fulfill that. So would that still be called vairagya because you don't want it, but you're doing it to satisfy somebody else's desire so to say how would you uh, again you would be the, the same action can be with vairagyam or without vairagyam only you will know that right so you say you're doing it to uh, your kid or wife wants something and you're doing it to make them happy um, you can afford it it's not um, costing you anything fine you know right uh, the action could be with vairagyam. But are you really doing it 
just to make them happy? Or are you doing it because if they're happy, then I will be happy. Or uh, if uh, they don't get this thing that they want, then uh, I'm going to be in trouble for it. So it's that it's, it's very subtle and it's very internal. So you'll have to ask yourself, what is your true motivation for this thing? If you're doing it purely selflessly, you're doing this thing uh, because it'll make the other person happy. That's beautiful. What's wrong with it? But uh, say if it's in the case of uh, a small kid and they don't have the discernment themselves right now of what is good for them and what is not good for them. So say they want to eat candy with a lot of sugar uh, right now and um, you let them, right? A little bit could be okay, but if you let them eat a lot of candy, what are you really, uh, are you really, helping that person yes it could make them momentarily happy but in the case of a child as a parent you have to exercise the discernment because they don't have the discernment themselves okay thank you can and i ask, excuse me can i can i ask something are sure, we looking good here only in this world or we are looking that we do not have any desire for uh, what is beyond our life. Maybe the, we talk about heaven or uh, ah, both. We have no more. That, that was the definition, right? So there was, we are looking for Vairagyam is detachment from fruits of action in this world or another world. So uh, another world meaning uh, a heaven, we're not looking for a heaven later or we're not looking for a better birth. And we're just, the Vairagyam is referring to both that was there in the definition. So, so I, and why don't we look for this uh, roots in the next world also? Because like I said, you realize that that next world is also limited, any fruits, that you get in that next world will also be limited and you're looking for permanent happiness so why will you have an attachment towards something uh, why will you put your time and attention and en energy into something which is not going to give you that permanent happiness until such time you know that's not your goal that's fine uh, you want temporary things uh, they're giving you temporary joy um, and uh, just know what you're doing. <laughs> so it's not attached. Uh, that will keep you from attaching excessive quality to an action or a thing. Thank you. So all legitimate sense pleasures are allowed, you know, are perfectly fine. Uh, scriptures will tell you how to go fulfill various goals you have, how to get various pleasures, but with the warning that none of them can be the ultimate goal in life because they're all perishable. What to do? So what do you do when a desire is observed? You don't need to judge the desire. It's what it is, what is present in the moment. So you can acknowledge there is a desire. If it is an adharmic desire, if it is a wrong desire in the sense, wrong, wrong in the sense that it will harm someone else or it will harm yourself, uh, that makes that desire adharmic. So in that case, it's okay to suppress it or inquire further into the desire and try to overcome that desire. But if the desire is dharmic, then go ahead and uh, fulfill that desire. But to ensure that it doesn't become uh, the primary objective or take you away from whatever is your primary objective at that point. So inquire into the desire when you have a desire. Because we all have limited um, 
resources, right? So we, we think of generally resources as money, but I like to think of resources as your time, energy, and money. So we have all of these in limited quantity. So to uh, get a certain amount of money you're putting in, it will take a certain amount of your time and energy. And most of these desires we want to fulfill will require some of that money. So is uh, so say it's a fancy vacation, like a fancy international vacation that you want. It's going to take a certain amount of money. Uh, and you're working really hard through the week. Uh, maybe you're working extra hours to make that extra money. In the end, you have to ask, is this worth that uh, fulfilling that desire for me? And the answer might be yes. Whatever energy I'm putting in uh, and money I will get from it, um, I'll be able to fulfill this desire. This is completely worth it for me. Then go ahead and indulge. It's perfectly fine, but uh, do it with um, this self-knowing, this self-awareness. Or you realize then you get to the year, end of the year, and you realize I wasted my time and energy in all these things and did not really go after the goals that I wanted. Right? So that's because there was a lack of discernment. Any further questions? So I won't go into new topic today because I am actually also in Rishikesh at the moment, attending a wonderful Vedanta retreat at uh, Swami Dhananda Ashram, where our lineage is from. So I would also like to get to my next session. We'll end shop at nine today. If there's no further questions, we can end the class. We looked at two, first two of the Sagna Chetushtaya, which is uh, Viveka, discernment, and Vairagyam, dispassion. And we have two left to look at. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Namaha Thank, Thank you. you. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.